started. We have a lot to cover today. I think 160 slides. So that's the bad news. Well, maybe the good news. The um, <clears throat> the gooder news is that I think I'm more on my game today. I was so off last Thursday. Did you? Was it uncomfortable to watch? Oh my gosh! It was. I just. That whole class, I was just like, I can't wait for this thing to get over. So when the half hour no short game, I was like, come on. So maybe that's just a Thursday thing. Maybe not. First thing is uh, to talk about uh, Thursday. It was definitely an off night for me. It felt off, uh, but I'm rested. I'm ready to go. I got eight hours of sleep last night. And, uh, ready to rock. So we, we do have a bunch to get through. These are the things that we covered on Thursday. We talked about security models. Um, I think two things that made it difficult to teach. One, I think I was really tired on Thursday. I was, uh, you know, I'm making excuses now. I was in Memphis, so I was thinking about barbecue. I wasn't thinking about you guys. Yep. And then uh, these are, there are so many things, I think, in that first part of Domain 3 that was so impractical. I mean, kind of, kind of practical, but, you know, we just don't use them. We don't use Biba, Bella Padula. We don't use Clark Wilson. We just rarely do any of those things but these are the things we covered the models we talked about <laughs> methods and certification accreditation that's where we talked about the red book uh, the orange book the rainbow series we talked about uh, IT sec and common criteria we talked about all those good things um, that day uh, we also talked about some secure system design concepts some architecture things and talked about some uh, OS for architecture stuff so it seemed maybe like it was a lot this is where we're going to pick up. We're going to talk about virtualization and distributed computing, some system vulnerabilities, threats, and countermeasures. Uh, we'll talk about cryptography, which is one of my favorite parts to talk about. I like, I'm a history guy, so I really enjoy history. Plus, I, uh, I think cryptography is just really cool. So we'll, we'll get through that. And then uh, physical security. So a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Um, so I'll probably be, probably be talking fairly quickly. Uh, there'll probably be a lot of questions. Um, I did get just a couple of questions between classes. So as you're struggling through this, um, or if you're not struggling through it, if you have any questions, let me know. So virtualization, uh, going back to you know, kind of where we left off, virtualization is really a separation from the computer hardware and the software or the operating system. So it allows us to run really multiple guest systems on one physical host. So guest and host are two, you know, real common terms here. Two different types of virtualization, transparent and para-virtualization. Transparent virtualization is what we're, most of us are used to. That's where uh, the hypervisor runs on a separate piece of software and then we install the operating systems on top of that. And so there's that separation in that virtualization and no changes to the OS. That's where we run our Windows systems and Linux systems. The other type, which we probably have very little um, experience with uh, would be the para virtualization, which is where I have to have a specially modified kernel. The operating system itself is modified uh, to run and share uh, hardware with different systems. Uh, the hypervisor. The hypervisor is that is the is the piece of software that really and it's software. It's it's what controls the separation between the operating systems that are running and the hardware. Uh, and it, there are some hypervisor attacks that have been done over the years. So, you know, you used to, um, before things get patched, they get patched really quick whenever we find vulnerabilities in hypervisors, but you can jump systems, go from one system to another sometimes uh, if you can compromise the hypervisor. Uh, type one uh, hypervisors and type two, it's a little bit different than, you know, the para virtualization and the, um, where type one, it's part of the operating system. Uh, so VMware ESX would be a type one hypervisor, and then things get installed on top of that. The type two runs as an application within uh, the operating system. Oftentimes this would be, you know, like maybe through a browser or a host-based application that's installed. Um, benefits, lower hardware costs, lower power costs, smaller footprint, these are good things. If you guys remember when blades became popular, we're not going to talk too much about blades today, but 
I remember when blades became popular, it was a smaller footprint. It was reduced power. It was like this big craze. And then people didn't really account for the heat, right? Huge amounts of heat. So then you had to put all those uh, cowlings on top of, you know, and yeah. Uh, but benefits here are, you know, kind of the same. Lower hardware, lower uh, power cost, smaller footprint, easier to manage. Uh, potentially security issues is it does add a layer of complexity to just our traditional you know, server operating system and usually you know and I, i've said it before that complexity is the enemy of security so the more complex we make things usually the harder they are to secure so that if we're going to hold that same concept then we could make a case potentially that uh, virtualization is less secure Easy to bring up new systems. It's easier to provision systems, um, which also can be a security problem because sometimes the easier I make things to put into production, I got, I, I'm not going through the checks and balances for that. Uh, issue with host and or supervisor could affect every guest. VM escape is one type of attack. There were a number of attacks and there's a number of white papers that have been written over the years on attacks on hypervisors. I don't know of any hypervisor attacks in any commercial um, VM software that um, is still out there. I think they get patched pretty fast. Um, a good rule of thumb is not to host systems with different security sensitivities on the same hardware. And that's kind of a good best practice too. If I was, uh, I was actually going through a UHG. I don't know if any of you guys have been through any of the UHG security stuff. So if you're doing business with UHG, they send somebody out to audit you, and part of their questionnaire is certainly. Do you have uh, multiple system, multiple security sensitivities running on the same server, right? Not just software, but hardware. This, this also plays a role. So it, it's a good idea to break those things out. I know in our phase three, when we ask about, uh, you know, specifically domain controller functions, you know, are they dedicated domain controller functions or do we also run a database and file shares and, you know, other things? It's good to keep those things separate. Uh, cloud computing. Cloud computing is kind of funny. Uh, excuse me. I think I think it's kind of funny because if you've been in IT for a while or you've been in security for a while, this is really nothing, anything new. But it was such a buzz a few years ago when uh, you know this new thing called cloud computing, and a lot of us were like, "What is this new thing, cloud computing?" And then you start kind of digging into it. And it's like we've been doing this for years. I mean, this is just so it's just sharing stuff. Uh, but you know in by the letter of the law, it's, uh, you know, leveraging economies of scale so I can have, uh, you know, you take like um, Office 365. I don't have to have a my own Exchange server anymore. I don't have to have an Exchange server admin. I don't have the hardware costs. I don't have to deal with the physical, physical security constraints around the data center, you know, stuff like that. Instead, what I can do is off that, offload that to, you know, like a Microsoft and, um, CGIS, so criminal justice uh, information system or standard, uh, requires separate hardware for hypervisors and network equipment. So there's a, a good piece of input from somebody online. Um, so instead, I can offload that to Microsoft. Microsoft can afford the data center. They've got you know top security uh, there, so I get to leverage that and, not, and just pay a, a portion of the cost. So infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, and software as a service are the three types of cloud computing. You can think of infrastructure as a service as being uh, essentially here's the hardware, you put your own operating system on it, you configure it, you run, put the applications on it, you configure it, you maintain it. Uh, it's truly just kind of a bare bones uh, hardware and then you put everything on top of it. The platform as a service, we give you the operating system, you install your applications and configure those other things. Uh, and then software as a service, where really everything is configured so it's something like uh, uh, what's the big uh, CRM package? Uh, people, well, people soft, but um, what's the other one where uh, Salesforce, like Salesforce.com, is probably the biggest, most famous, you know, software as a service. But Office 365 is the same way, and uh, you know, the whole Google suite of applications is the same way. Software as a service. Private clouds and public clouds. A private cloud is something that's really dedicated usually to one single customer. You do have hybrids of this. We've got um, kind of a semi-private cloud where it's a group of companies or organizations. You see this a lot of times in maybe nonprofits or healthcare, 
where the hospital kind of all gets together, pools their resources, and gets their own kind of private cloud. Uh, and then there's, you know, the public cloud, which most of us are pretty used to. Uh, so somebody's got some background noise. Hopefully it's not me with the background noise uh, for the mute. Somebody's just saying that there's some background noise. But I could be humming. Hmm. <laughs> I can't do that and talk. Security issues, very strict SLAs. One of the things I've always struggled with with cloud computing is I have limited visibility. I don't really truly know what's going on with my stuff. Uh, I'm relying on whatever they're doing for logging and monitoring. Um, I kind of like seeing the details because I'm really relying a lot on their expertise to, to determine if something bad is happening or not. So I, I kind of get a little bit uh, upset with, not upset, but uh, concerned about the limited visibility. Shared infrastructure means a shared target. So if I have multiple tenants or, you know, companies using the same, you know, platform, uh, and we're sharing that, and one of them, let's say one of them's a, a government entity or something, and it's, you know, it's a target for hacktivists or something, that could bring me down as well. So that's, a, that's an issue sometimes with shared infrastructure. Uh, what I want uh, whenever I'm going to engage with a cloud computing company is the right to audit. You'd want this in any vendor risk management program. So that means that when I, when I kind of deem necessary, given some certain parameters, I should be able to ask you about your controls and, and, and audit those things to make sure you're meeting my security requirements. Now, good luck doing that with Microsoft. Good luck doing that with Google. But you know, maybe it's a, another company that you kind of have that uh, you, you can push a little bit on that. Right to assess. So I like being able to do vulnerability assessments. I like to do be able to do vulnerability scans, uh, or at least have you give me uh, vulnerability scans, and so I can review that stuff. Uh, the right to audit. So I'd like to be able to pen test uh, the environment. We do a lot of that with uh, Amazon Cloud. You know, we have customers who have Amazon environments, and you, they have a nice formal process where you can request the right. You know. The, the, the ability to pen test and then they give you a you know kind of the date and time and stuff like that uh, another issue I have sometimes with cloud computing is physical boundaries geographically it might go across countries and I have different laws and requirements that apply um, I might be a company that um, it's a financial services company and GLBA is a big thing for me but my data is being hosted in Singapore or something where GLBA doesn't apply well they haven't set up their security requirements that way so I can run into issues with that so that's cloud computing grid computing grid computing is really taking a bunch of computers and uh, kind of combining them together as a single big fast system um, so spare resources are typically pooled you can go and you know like I, I put SETI at home there because I think that's a kind of a cool one but you can join SETI at home and install a little lab and then your computer will participate in that grid um, and set at home is the, that's the looking for aliens thing uh, you haven't heard of that no no am I the only geek here you've heard of SETI no are you guys wow I'm weird yeah SETI at home it's pretty cool looking for aliens and stuff Mike Scully has it uh, so anyway, 5.2 million participants worldwide logging, you know, more than 2 million years of aggregate computing time by pooling, you know, all those resources. That's an example of, you know, grid computing. Voluntary bot, yep, basically, that's true. Well, other than the fact that they don't actually have control of your computer, they're just kind of sharing resources. I think of a bot as like, I own this thing, I make it do what I want. Hey, hey. How you doing? Good to see you, man. All right, so peer-to-peer -peer networks. This is uh, poses some security issues. We'll get digger. We'll dig deeper into peer-to-peer. -peer, I think when we got talk about the uh, network architecture in the next domain. Uh, but any system, really, the thing that makes peer-to-peer kind of cool is that any system can act as a client or server or both at any given time. It's decentralized and neutral, so it's a great place to just kind of collaborate and share files all over the place. Uh, what I don't know if you guys remember Napster, but Napster used to be a big place where you'd get your music, your MP3 files, back when that was cool. Um, what took Napster down was the central index servers. So that's actually what 
it had been truly a decentralized neutral way peer-to-peer -peer purely is meant to be uh, Napster probably still be running maybe uh, but Nutella and BitTorrent are examples of other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, type networks intellectual property issues data integrity and data loss are all risks with peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks more things about virtualization and distributed computing thin clients thin clients have become really popular it's interesting if you've been in IT long enough you remember when everything was kind of a mainframe and you had terminals right that would connect so everything was really centralized and then you went to this uh, client server model when Microsoft and Novell and everything and then everything expanded everywhere put servers everywhere and now there's kind of just this little push back to the, having this centralized environment again thin clients are you know a big part of that so usually with thin clients, they kind of have, uh, kind of usually they kind of have just about everything, but they're not um, full PCs. So they usually don't have disks. The most popular is the uh, the diskless workstation in a true thin client environment. Um, so CPU, memory, firmware, no disk drive, kernel operating system are loaded from the network. Everything is accessed from the network. Everything is stored, you know, on a centralized system. The boot process typically is BIOS. TCP IP part of that would then be you know initiating boot P or DHCP depending on what type of environment you're working in DHCP is a lot more robust and we'll talk about DHCP when we get to the next domain about all the features that you can really enable in a DHCP system uh, so diskless workstations is one type and then thin client applications this is typically a browser based access to a centralized application everything is stored there uh, terminal server is kind of almost like a thin client application where I'd open up RDP and access, access things uh, on the central server from there. The thing with RDP is I can also map network drives and copy files off if I don't set it up that way. So, moving on. All right, uh, Internet of Things. This is like, I put security freaking nightmare because, man, seriously, I can't even believe we're doing this. It's just yeah, oh my God, I, 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 I don't know. People are people, and it's funny to me. So small internet uh, connected devices, refrigerators, TVs, home automation, your garage door, your lights, your whatever you name it. Um, it's not off limits for the Internet of Things. I would never, ever, ever hook any of these things up to the net to an internet to the internet ever. It, it, it baffles me. It's like letting people like into your house just like hey come take stuff and stuff why would I ever need my refrigerator connected to the internet you know remind me what I need to get for the grocery store but there's other ways so anyway uh, it is a security nightmare um, EFF the electronic frontier foundation agrees uh, vendors don't patch poor customer support features oh almost always seem to overrule this security thing, right? Security just gets in the way of the new whiz-bang features, and that's what's happening, and that's what's going to continue to happen. I, I don't know what the end result is going to be there. Government involvement, probably. Uh, other threats, uh, or threats and vulnerabilities, emanations. So emanations is really where energy escapes from an electronic system. It could be, in, usually it's in like, uh, like an EMI or it could be just electronic pulses, usually MI. Tempest is not a, an acronym that actually is the code name given by the NSA on how to, uh, it's really a set, a set of standards. It's a set of standards and more, uh, but we, for us it's a set of standards on how to protect against emanations. So if you see Tempest on the exam, it's not that game from the 80s where you used to do the little thing and go around and sh yeah. It's not that Tempest, different one. It's this one. So shielding standards, uh, many are classified, but there are some, I think, three levels that are public. And you don't need to know what three levels are public, but if you wanted to find out, you could. Covert, covert channels, covert channels. Covert channels are, we've mentioned this before, any communication that violates the security policy of the system would be considered a covert channel. Two of the most popular types of covert channels are storage channels and, the other, and timing channels. The storage channels typically is using things like temp files and cache, and it more it's more of an inference attack. So, uh, or it could be you could have uh, what collusion and have you know two people involved in, in the in the attack. But it's essentially um, you know if I have top secret clearance and you have 
secret clearance. Uh, one of the things that may not be accounted for in our clearance levels in the system configuration is where temp files are stored and how we put things there. So I could intentionally put something into or make the temp file do something that would then queue you into something you shouldn't know. And that would be a covert channel, uh, storage channel. Uh, timing channel is also usually an inference attack uh, and it's looking for timing and delays and processing. So um, certain things take a certain amount of time to process before the computer will give you back a, a response. Um, and I think in the book they used the example, which I thought was a really good example about a login. If I get my username right and my password wrong, it takes this long to get the response back. If I get my username wrong and my password wrong, it takes this this long to get it back. Different timing. So I, then I can tell, okay, well, this, these must be legitimate passwords because it took this amount of time versus taking this amount of time. Does that kind of make sense? That's a, that, that was a good example in the book about a timing channel. Uh, back doors, maintenance hooks. Uh, back doors are just, so usually what happens, I find that the most common method of attack is you identify a vulnerability, you compromise the vulnerability, you then elevate your privileges to an administrator, plant a back door, delete log files, and come back later. So that back door is, is planted by the attacker so that you can come back to the system later without having to go through the same channels or security checks. Um, so that that's a backdoor. A maintenance hook is usually something that's put in by the designer or the programmer while they're developing the application and it's to enable them to make changes to the application without having to go through the additional steps of logging into the system. So it's to speed up their development. Sometimes those things end up being left in production systems. That would be a bad thing. So that, that's a maintenance hook. Malware, different types of malware. Uh, zero day exploit, good exp uh, that's been one that I think it's misunderstood, you know, what a zero day exploit is. Really it's something for which it's a vulnerability or an exploit that w for which there's no patch. There's no vendor patch for it. So it may not be something that only I know about that kind of zero day. Uh, you could have a zero day exploit that's maybe a year old, but there's no patch for it. That's still a zero day exploit. Uh, computer viruses, different types of malware. They don't spread automatically. I, I always remember uh, worms spread, viruses embed. It's just kind of what I've always remembered. Uh, so viruses, they don't spread automatically. Types of viruses, there's a bunch of different types. Macro viruses are uh, less popular, but still popular. Um, that would be like something in Word where I can enable macros and it could do something that uh, I didn't intend it to do usually written in something like VB dot, uh, uh, VB for VBA, VB for application, something like that. Boot sector viruses, this is actually where I started my information security career was cleaning boot sector viruses on a help desk. Uh, they used to be super popular because everybody used to, you know, use floppies and things. Um, but boot sector viruses just infect the boot sector uh, and can, you know, boot up a different part of the operating system load up prior to the operating system or you know any number of things. Stealth viruses are ones that you don't see, know about. Uh, polymorphic viruses are viruses that change uh, either based on uh, so certain events or based on time. Uh, and then multipartite viruses are viruses that uh, have more than one part to them. So more than one function in a multipartite virus. Uh, is there a way to identify or clean up maintenance hooks in the production servers and software? There are applications that you can use to scan your source code uh, to find those things that might be uh, still there. Uh, when you put things into production, you know, doing things like vulnerability scans sometimes can find things. Uh, if it's a web application, using a tool like Acunetics uh, or something like that might be able to find a maintenance hook in a system. So there are systems, good best practice whenever you have a development team is that you have peer review, you have code reviews that get to take place every so often, uh, peer reviews and third party reviews looking for stuff like maintenance hooks. Other malware, worms self propagate, worms propagate virus, no, worms spread viruses embed. Uh, Self-propagate damages include the malicious code itself. So whatever the worm has been designed to do, whether it's steal data or 
plant something, whatever. Second, is to spread to other systems. So I'm going to have some, at least a negligible um, network uh, impact. Famous worms, Morris worm, that's kind of the granddaddy worm. It's kind of the, the first one everybody, anybody ever knew about. It was written by Robert Morris, kind of as a proof of concept. But then it kind of a little bit got out of hand for him, but it was okay. Because back then there wasn't a lot of computers connected to the internet anyway. So the I love you virus, NIMDA, Code Red, Melissa, those are all famous worms. There's a lot of them. Uh, Trojans, so Trojan, just like, you know, if you're a fan of history and, you, you know, the Trojan War, it works kind of the same way. So the, the, the application itself looks as though and acts as though it's, an, it's a real, normal uh, piece of software. But when you execute it or run it, then something else happens in the background that you may or may not know about. So one function is benign, the other one's malicious. Famous Trojans, the Zeus Trojan, that's a big one in, in banking, and there's so many different variants of that one. Uh, Crypto Locker is, at the root, it actually is a Trojan, um, and we're all dealing with kind of the ransomware fallout. Not, some of us are dealing with it personally, others, others of us are helping fix it, I guess. We haven't been hit by it. Nobody's immune, though, you know, and it just takes one person to open, so... Yeah, we, we do employ people, so I assume it's probably going to happen someday. Uh, Netbus, back orifice, uh, Shadoon, which is uh, for the uh, Android. So lots of different Trojans. Rootkits, rootkits are, if, if it's a kernel mode rootkit, sometimes it's very difficult to get rid of those. And um, if it is a rootkit, sometimes it's better just to start from scratch, just reload everything, because you're never really sure what a rootkit did, I think, to your system. So replacements portions of the kernel or operating system. There's two types of rootkits, user land and ring zero kernel mode rootkits. Um, common rootkitted binaries, LS, PS, although so in a Linux system, LS is to uh, uh, list the directory. Uh, for some reason, my mind is completely spacing on PS, but yeah, yeah. there you go, process status. Thank you. <laughs> my mind just went, eh. All right. Uh, other things, Packers, besides the terrible football team. So I'm not a pa – are you a Packers fan? <laughs> are you a Packers fan too? No? Ter oh, see, so we got all kinds of Packers. I knew that was going to cause a stir. All right. A little bit. Uh, not those Packers. Not that awesome football team <laughs> to our east. I'm talking about different kind of – it just got real in here. So people are paying attention. That's good. Um, so packers really are just a compression. They compress uh, executables. A lot of times they're used for real uh, legitimate reasons, but you can also, an attacker can also use it to evade signature-based detection. They probably want to get by like a heuristic-based detection engine, maybe. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a packer. Uh, some people bleed purple. That's right. Logic bombs. Logic bombs are interesting. We these get the news sometimes because like something bad. You know, I get fired from a company. I might plant a logic bomb as retaliation. So, a logic bomb gets triggered when a logical event happens. It can either be a number of events. It could be a counter of some sort. A time-based logic bombs. Um, yeah, and so you can whack an entire server. You know unleash something else bad whatever logic bombs uh, the important thing to remember about logic bombs is some condition has to be met some logical condition and then it executes antivirus software uh, <laughs> see now it's all Vikings draft choices have been a logic bomb see now it's getting nobody's paying attention anymore and that's gonna be about football now they are yep that's the right context uh, signature based Two, two types of antivirus software, signature-based and heuristic-based uh, software. One of the things I've found over the years is people put a lot more stock into antivirus software than they should. They think, oh, well, I don't have to worry about opening attachments in emails because I have antivirus software. That's so wrong. Symantec themselves, you know, one of the leaders in making antivirus software, essentially came out and said a couple of years ago that antivirus is dead. Um, so you really can't rely on antivirus uh, software. Not that you don't need it, 
but usually I think I don't know what the latest date is, but it seems like it, it takes about 30 days or more for antivirus signatures to get updated with zero day stuff, you know, new brand new. And if I'm an attacker and I'm going to be attacking somebody, and I'm going to put forth all this work of developing a piece of malware. Don't you think I'm going to get Symantec and McAfee and Sophos and get all these software and test it to make sure it doesn't get detected? And then I'm going to unleash it on the world. And then I know I've got about 30 days of free time with this thing before it's just going to get stopped. I still won't get caught. So attackers know that stuff. So just be careful with AV. Uh, two different types of attack. That one on the right is uh, uh, crap. Name is escaping me. That's uh, I can't remember what, what attack that is now. It's totally escaping me. But anyway, server side and client side attacks. A server side attack is essentially, at the, in the purest sense, it's an attacker attacking a service, not necessarily a server, but a service running on another system. So it's kind of a direct attack. No, it's not man in the middle. That's um, what attack is that? Uh, I can't remember, but anyway, I'll figure out. No, well, sort of, but that's not the attack. Anyway, I can't remember. Uh, and then download, uh, so client-side attacks are really downloads, and those are harder to stop because a lot of companies don't do a good job of egress filtering. A lot of companies do a pretty good job of ingress filtering, so that means things originating from the outside coming in. We block those things. We only allow like port 80 or whatever to certain systems in the DMZ. What people don't do a very good job of is restricting what I can access outbound. And so that's kind of sad. That's why client side attacks are drown attack. Thank you, Gerald. You win. It's the drown attack. Drown, D R O W N. It is a, an SSL TLS attack. Uh, client side attacks, yeah. So anyway, egress filtering is one way to really prevent a little bit more of the, of the, the client-side attacks. A lot more people are putting web filtering in place, which helps a little bit too. But web filtering only does web traffic. doesn't stop anything from port 25 or 21 or anything else. And you see all the attacks, like the, the popular attacks, usually the way of, for, to exfiltrate data is through one of these, you know, like just FTP it out. Nobody's even watching it. You know, so you see a lot of the exfiltration because also because of poor egress filtering. Uh, other things, one thing to introduce you to if you're not already familiar with it is the OWASP top 10. With the latest one was 2013 because it hasn't really changed that much. Uh, but if you follow these top 10, uh, if you protect yourself against these top 10 attacks, uh, supposedly you'll prevent 90% of all the attacks, which I guess is pretty good. We'll just do those 10. Uh, applets, things to remember about applets. What will be on the exam, you are not gonna go into deep, uh, in deep about applets, but there's two types, Java and ActiveX, and the difference between the two, the primary difference is the security for Java is the sandbox. The security for Act ActiveX is the digital certificates. There is no sandbox for ActiveX. Uh, and there are no, well, there are digital certificates for Java, but that's not what provides the security in this context. Uh, but applets are, you know, little bits of code that you download from the system and they, they run locally, which can get kind of scary. Uh, we have, I don't know how many Java patches over the years, and a lot of those have been around the Java virtual machine trying to keep the sandbox more sandboxy. Things are supposed to stay in the sandbox. Java is also platform independent. If I'm running the Java virtual machine, so it doesn't matter what type of operating system I'm running it on, ActiveX only runs on uh, Microsoft machines. I put M$, that's how I, that's how I uh, abbreviate Microsoft. Uh, and digital certificates are for security. So one of the things we see a lot with people is they get something that pops up and says, hey, would you want to run this ActiveX control? And you say, yeah, just get out of my way. Well, when you say yes, you're basically saying, I trust that certificate, run it. That's not a good thing either. So these both pose some pretty big security problems. Right. Uh, XML, we don't need to know a bunch about XML for the exam. We just need to know that XML uh, is another 
method of providing security, uh, rules for encoding documents, uh, formats. Uh, XML can be really I'm not using it. Um, all XML documents should begin should begin with a de declaration of you know some information about themselves. And I just give you an example right there. The other one is uh, SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. We're going to get into that more later on, certainly around DCOM and CORBA. Uh, just DCOM is Distributed Component Object Model, and CORBA is kind of the same thing, but in a non-Microsoft world. Uh, but it allows interfaces for uh, applications to uh, share things. So applications can share services across a network via some communications protocol. So. SOA is the architecture, so if you take a look at SOAP, the P in SOAP is protocol. That's the method for using the service-oriented architecture. At this point, you don't need to know too much about this. We're going to uh, hit on this again when we get into software development stuff. Poly instantiation, so talking about data, database security. Poly instantiation really, and we'll get into this more too when we get into the, uh, the um, software side of things. Uh, two different objects or instances with the same name. This becomes kind of an issue if we don't use poly instantiation in a database model and I need to have multiple security levels access the same database or the same table. What I would use is I use poly instantiation and essentially we're fibbing or lying uh, in, that, in that model where we've got uh, kind of some fake data if I don't have the right clearance levels. Because I have two instances with the same name, but they have different security levels. Does that make sense a little bit? <laughs> She's like, no. We'll talk, we can talk later about poly instantiation. And it'll probably make more sense later on too. Uh, two types of attacks, inference and aggregation. So inference is really using clues. So I don't know the actual fact, but I know enough clues around that fact to infer that this must be true. Um, Controls such as poly instantiation and diffusion. Diffusion, we'll talk about a lot more when we get into um, encryption. Diffusion, confusion, transposition, and permutation. Those will be things that you'll memorize and be experts in. I used a lot of big words right there. I'm kind of proud of myself. <laughs> uh, aggregation. Uh, it's another way that we can um, attack a system. Uh, it's a mathematical process. There is no deduction. There's no inference. It's really asking every possible question about something and getting those answers back, and then that would be your aggregation, aggregating all that data. One control might be you just limit the number of queries that you can make uh, on a system because I can't ask all the possible questions then. Oh, here we are. Look at this, you guys. Encryption. How do you guys feel about this? You ready? Let's dig in, right? All right, key terms. You'll need to understand these terms. You'll need to memorize these terms. These are pretty important terms when it comes to encryption. So cryptology, it's got, it's got ology at the end of it, so that's science. It's the science of secure communications. Uh, cryptography is creating the messages. Uh, the meaning is hidden. What comes from that is the ciphertext, which is coming up a little bit later on. Cryptanalysis is the science of breaking encrypted messages. So uh, we'll talk about some of the crypto analysts, crypto analysts. That's what it is. It's crypt. It's crypt analysis is the science of breaking it, and then it's crypto analyst is somebody who breaks it. Yeah. Uh, cryptology again. Uh, both cryptography and cryptanalysis. Cipher is the cryptographic algorithm, plain text, unencrypted, ciphertext, encrypted. Encryption is taking plain text, making it into ciphertext. The encryption is reverse, taking ciphertext and making it into plain text. Uh, yes, that would be both definitions. Yep, good catch. Yep, the key word in cryptology is the science piece though. If you see science on the exam, you're thinking crypto cryptology. We could probably drop that middle one. All right, uh, more cornerstone crypt cryptographic concepts, um, confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. Uh, cryptography can provide confidentiality and integrity of data. We'll talk about how that happens uh, when we talk about uh, you know 
symmetric and asymmetric encryption and how it protects the confidentiality of the message. We can also use asymmetric encryption and hashing to verify the integrity of data. So cryptography can do that. Cryptography cannot pr improve availability. It typically takes away from availability. There are some CPU cycles that have to go into encrypting things and decrypting things. So it ends up usually taking away from availability a little bit. Uh, cryptography can provide authentication, proving the identity claim, uh, and can provide non-repudiation. We'll talk about that when we get to digital signatures. That's a big piece. Um, one of the things we used to get a lot for pushback when we were trying to push encryption, certainly on laptops and things like that, was, oh, it'll make my computer run really slow. Most, and even back then, it was usually about 4 to 5% overhead in the CPU, you know, to encrypt the hard drive. I mean, you'd have like this uh, maybe 10%, but then it would step down, maybe 10% to get through that full pass, you know, of encrypting the hard drive, and then it would be like 4 or 5%. Uh, Again, what non-repudiation means is that you know somebody who did something can't say they didn't do it. We can prove that you did do it, uh, so you can't repudiate or deny doing something. That's non-repudiation. So we can use encryption to do that. And that comes a lot with digital signatures. When I can sign something digitally, now I no longer have to, and it's become a lot more uh, accepted now. You know, that I don't have to physically sign something with my hand signature. I can now digitally sign things. And the big piece of that is the non-repudiation. I can't claim I didn't sign it. We'll talk about how that works. Uh, more cornerstone concepts. These are things that encryption algorithms do to make things, make ciphertext. Uh, confusion, diffusion, substitution, and permutation. Uh, confusion is uh, taking things and kind of mixing them up. Uh, as random as possible. That's the confusion. Diffusion means dispersing it amongst the ciphertext. So just mixing them up is one is one thing, but diffusing it across the entire ciphertext is another thing. Uh, substitution is just replacing something for another. The most simple substitution algorithm would be like a monoalphabetic, right? Where I substitute one letter with another letter, and that's my that's the easiest one. Uh, permutation, also called transposition, gives you confusion by rearranging the characters of the plain text. Uh, substitution and permutation are typically com com combined to give you the confusion and diffusion. Does that make sense? Sort of? Okay. The big thing about uh, encryption is destroying patterns. You want it to be as random as possible because a crypto analyst will use the non-randomness to try to, de to, try to uh, deduct or deduce what the key is or the plain text. Uh, good encryption, strong for key-based, uh, very difficult, ideally impossible. So we call it computationally infeasible. It's usually what we say to convert the ciphertext back to plain text without the key. Uh, work factor is how long it takes to break the crypto system, uh, meaning to decrypt the ciphertext. So the work factor has to be less than the value of whatever I'm decrypting, right? Uh, and then secrecy, so Kirchhoff's principle is an important part of encryption. There's only one encryption algorithm I think we're gonna talk about today that's not secret. Uh, that's the idea, that's a, um, that's a symmetric encrypt, encryption algorithm. We'll talk about that later. Um, but. It's not the encryption algorithm itself that makes it strong, right? So I should be able to, like, like DES uh, did encryption standard, the advanced encryption standard, which is the, uh, um, those are all open standards. I can see how the math is all done. That's not what makes the crypto encryption strong. That's called Kirchhoff's principle. That might be on the test. Seems like I've seen it a lot of times. Not in the test though. All right, so different uh, ciphers. So ciphers are ways and are algorithms for creating the cipher text. Monoalphabetic is that's one we used to play with when we were kids, probably. Just substitute one letter for another. There's a rotation involved, so you see the rot 13 and down there. Uh, that, that was it's used in Usenet, um, but the rotation is 13 characters. That's what ROT means. So when we get to the Caesar cipher, that was a ROT3, so a rotation of three characters. So the A became a D, 
B became an E, so it rotated three characters down. That's a monoalphabetic cipher, uh, susceptible to frequency analysis. So in frequency analysis, we know that the most common letter in the English alphabet is E. So if I look at a long enough cipher text, um, I look for the one that's common, that would probably be an E. So that's, that's frequency analysis. Polyalphabetic uses uh, more than one um, alphabet. It doesn't have to be two, but it could be just two. And then there's a cipher disk there, a picture of one from um, the Civil War, uh, where you first you know, encrypt it with the first ring, and then you encrypt it again with the second ring, the next round, polyalphabetic. It does a little bit better on the, uh, nope, I'm gonna go back to here again, on the confusion. But it still is susceptible to frequency analysis. This is just uh, letter frequency, normalized frequency across the letters. So if, uh, if you had a monoalphabetic, it, you know, you definitely, this would be important. But you can see how we would use that to uh, decrypt messages. Other cornerstones, so those were kind of two ciphers in a way, just basic, you know, monoalphabetic and polyalphabetic. Now going a little bit uh, deeper, a little bit more complex is or other concepts, I guess. Modular math is one. So modular math is kind of the what the the leftover, and you rotate it around and you start over again. So there's a great example there. So adding the letter Y, the 25th letter, to the letter Z, the third letter, equals B because we rotate it after six. You know, so we had two left over and rotated it around. Sometimes it's called clock math. Uh, so that's important in cryptography because a lot of crypt cryptographic algorithms rely on modular math, uh, and then the exclusive OR is a very uh, important, and it's in just about every uh, symmetric yeah. encryption algorithm now, not so much asymmetric, but the symmetric ones. Uh, so it's um, really combining plain text with the ciphertext at a bit level. So a one and a zero equals a one, a zero and a zero equals a zero, so on and so forth. Um, and there's a, yeah, there's the table. Zero, zero, zero. So if the two bits are the same, they equal zero. If the two bits are different, they equal a one. So if you take attack at dawn with the key unicorn, you can see A in binary and the U in binary. So you go the first bit on the left, zero, zero is a zero. A zero, a one, one is a zero. A zero, zero is a zero. A zero, one is a one. You know what I'm saying? You just go on and on. And so, one of the in the quiz that I'll send after tonight, we'll, we'll I'll just have you do this with one, just to work it through. And yeah, it'll be fun. Hmm? Called the logic gate. This is you'll need to know this, I think, for the exam because this is really cornerstone, really important stuff with uh, encryption algorithms. Is the logic gate. All right, three primary types of encryption that we're gonna talk about uh, and that will be on the exam, symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing. So symmetric encryption is using the same key to encrypt and decrypt. The challenge of symmetric encryption is if I'm gonna encrypt it and Phil's gonna decrypt it, somehow I have to get Phil the key. Uh, that's one of the downfalls of symmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption, two keys, one to encrypt and then a paired key, but a different key to decrypt. So we use that in public-private key encryption. So what's encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key. And what's encrypted with the private key can only be decrypted with the public key. That's, an, that's asymmetric encryption. And then hashing is a one-way uh, encryption. It's a one-way crypto, cryptographic transformation. So <clears throat> in a hashing function, uh, I can take, we use this in passwords all the time, right? So I type in my password, it gets hashed, and the hash gets stored in the database, not my password itself. So if somebody hacked the database, they would get the hash, but they would never get my password. The only thing that should hash to that same value would be my password again. So when I type my password again, it gets hashed, the two hashes get compared, and then I get authenticated, right? Uh, if two, oh, we'll get to this later, but if two different values hash to the same value, that's called a collision, and that's a weakness in, in hashing. We'll, we'll talk about that later too. Any questions so far? We're cruising? Yeah, we're kicking butt right now. 
told you I'm on top of it today. Uh, so cryptography, history, I find that the history of cryptography just to be freaking amazing because it's been used for like ever and it's really tilted tilted the scales of world power in a lot of different ways and a lot of, you know, in wars and things. So in Egyptian hieroglyphic, let me drink some water. The Egyptian people used to do uh, these things, these pictures, and that was a form of encryption because it was a hidden message. Uh, the Spartan side tale is kind of cool. So the key, you know, I mentioned uh, plain text, cipher text, and key in a symmetric encryption algorithm, right? Those are the kind of the three pieces. So I take the plain text, combine it with the key, basically, run it through the encryption algorithm, and then I get the cipher text. So in the case of a Spartan Cytale, the um, the key is the diameter of the rod. So in order for me to decrypt that message, I would have to have a rod of the same diameter, you know, the receiver. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. So... Sparta, you take a piece of parchment, you'd write your messages on it, and then you take the parchment and send it on its way. The guy would get it, wrap it around, go, oh, yeah. Assuming it got there. Uh, so that's how, that was, you know, it's pretty cool stuff. Cipher, uh, the Caesar cipher and, and other rotation ciphers, so monoalphabetic. I mentioned before the rotation of three, that was the, the Caesar cipher. Uh, the rotation at the end of the day can be anything you want. It's very weak because it is subject to you know, easy frequency analysis. Uh, ROD 13 is still, I think, used today on bulletin board systems like Usenet. I haven't used Usenet for like ever, but maybe it's still there. Uh, veneer cipher. So the veneer cipher is a polyalphabetic cipher, and it looks like this table here. So on one side would be the key, the other side would be the message, and then you'd marry them together, and where they met, that would be the cipher text. Uh, pretty old. 26 times to form a metric. It's polyalphabetic, so we have multiple alphabets. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty hard to break that. I think that's on the quiz, too, that I made, is having you guys use this to encrypt a message. Yeah. Isn't it fun to be at my house? Uh, knowing, yes. Yeah, not knowing dates. Like, you won't have to know the veneer cipher was the 16th century, and it was written by Blaise D. Veneer. You don't need to know that, but you need to know what the veneer cipher is. Yep. Uh, cipher disks, I mentioned, you know, briefly before, that's a polyalphabetic cipher. You could have a monoalphabetic cipher if you only decided to use one of the rings. That's another picture of a Civil War one. Um, pretty old, but it, and pretty easy to use. Just one, you'd, roll, you'd use the first disk to encrypt it once and then rotate and then use the second disk to encrypt again, basically. Used for a long time, all the way through the Civil War. Jefferson disks? Jefferson disks, they didn't even know it existed until not that long ago. I mean, within our lifetime, it was kind of hidden. But um, 36 wooden disks, there's an offset that ends up kind of being the key. Uh, and then the order of the disks actually is the key where it's in the rotation. You don't need to know much about the Jefferson disks. I actually don't even know how it functionally, functionally works. I've never had to use it. It'd be weird. Walk into a customer. All right, guys. Encryption. <laughs> We're going to use the Jefferson disks today. Uh, book cipher and running key cipher. The book cipher is you just basically agree on a book. I agree on a, uh, and you do the page number, the line, and the word offset of each word, and then that becomes your cipher text. Uh, there's a good example in the book how Benedict Arnold used the ciphertext, the book cipher, um, to communicate with the, the British. The running key cipher uses uh, whole words, and there's an example of the running key cipher on the right. So the message, the plain text, is the attack at dawn. We're going to use the Constitution. We the people comes from the Constitution, doesn't it? Yeah. We the people is going to be our source test text, and our running key is just going to be encrypting both of those together. That's the running key. So they both use some text, whether it be a book, a uh, poem, whatever. The book cipher would use a book, but they both use text that way. Uh, one just uses the offset, and so what you'll get for your encryption 
your, your uh, ciphertext will be numbers in the running key you'd actually get letters. Does that make sense? All right. Code books, just using code words for people, locations. So, you know, I might refer to uh, Phil as awesome. And I'll refer to computer as, you know, buttercup. So I'll say awesome's buttercup. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's an example. Code words for things. Uh, one time pad is actually the only encryption algorithm that's been proven to be secure. It cannot be decrypted. It cannot be, as long as you meet those three conditions on the bottom. So as long as the characters on the pad are truly random, the pads are kept secure, so nobody has one, and the pages are never reused, uh, you cannot decrypt or really attack a one-time pad. Um, so one page is used to encrypt, yeah. Pad, yeah, it's like a pad of paper. Well, in the true sense, you can you can mechanicalize it or you know make it a computer program too. One page is used to encrypt the data. The same page of the receiver is used to decrypt, and then you get rid of the pages and never reuse them. Uh, and then you go on to the next, you know, page. That's one-time pad. Uh, here's an example of a one-time pad being actually used in a machine. Uh, Gilbert Vernum, so the Vernum cipher. at and there's a picture of it. Uh, but basically, it's one-time pads that were XORed. So using that uh, logic gate uh, with the plain text bits. So you take the one-time pad bits, take your plain text, XOR them, there's your cipher text. Project Venona. So Venona was, uh, you know, I don't know, it's not test, yeah, it's, I put in there, it's not testable. Uh, but Venona was the attack on, by the, well, the United States and the UK trying to decrypt uh, Soviet communications. Because the Soviets were using one-time pads. Um, and, you know, it's back in the spy days when, well, still are spy days, but, so they're trying to break the encryption. Uh, it would have been, we would have never been able to break the encryption had the KGB followed those three rules, but they were reusing pads and that's what led to the successful um, attack. Uh, names were decrypted and that's where Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were busted, it was Project Bonona. Cool history, I think, there's so much of it. You guys ever watch any of these movies? Imitation Game, U571, and The Queen's Men. These were all around Enigma, but there's a lot of good movies about encryption. Yeah, Enigma was the uh, encryption machine used by the Nazis. Good. I like the Imitation Game. I thought that was a good movie. And the, the guy kind of bugged me. Just, just, you know, so awkward. Hebrew machines in purple. So these are rotor machines. Uh, Rotor machines, they look just like the one on the right. Manual typewriters used to World War One and World War II, and they would just rotate the rotor based on whatever offsets you had and what have you. You don't need to know the details of how these work, but just that they are such things. Enigma, so it was, it's probably the most famous uh, encryption rotor machine used by the Germans back in World War II. And this is, I think, so cool that uh, what Sir Henry Hensley said, the war instead of finishing in 1945 would have ended in 1948 had they not been able to crack Enigma. So the war would have lasted three more years. God knows how many more people would have died if it wasn't for some guys sitting in a back room trying to break this thing. It's pretty pretty cool. Uh, Segaba was our own uh, rotor machine, never been broken, supposedly. Large, heavy, you can look at it on the right hand side. That's not something you're going to carry around uh, on the field, in the field probably. But uh, good, anyway. Purple, purple is kind of cool. As far as I know, there is no full machine left of purple, just parts of it, fragments of it. Uh, it's not actually a rotor machine, it's actually a switching machine uh, built with phone switch hardware. And I think there's a good story about that one too. about the, you know, how we were alerted to the sneak attack on Midway Island because we were able to uh, decrypt the messages uh, that the Japanese sent. And the way they tested it too, they weren't sure exactly what AF meant in this, in this story. So what they did is they sent a weak encryption message saying that they're having water problems on AF. And then the Japanese, you know, sent out a message to their troops saying there's a water problem on AF and then they knew 
they were talking about Midway Island. So it's pretty cool. I think it'd be so hard to decrypt data on a machine that's this complex and have the language complexities added to it. I mean, that that's crazy. Uh, so two uh, cryptographic laws or cryptography laws. One's COCOM, the other one's going to be the Wassenauer uh, arrangement. So COCOM was Cold War. Uh, COCOM was really meant to prevent the export of encryption to non-COCOM countries, which in this case have, happened to be mostly uh, Cold War countries like Russia and all those. Um, that's what COCOM is. The Wassenauer arrangement was after COCOM ended. Uh, so starting in 1996, this one, you know, the Cold War is done. So the Soviet Union and a bunch of other countries, uh, well, actually the Soviet Union didn't. Uh, the Russian Federation did, I guess, for to be accurate. Um, joined the Wassenaar Arrangement. It's, it, it still applies to exporting cryptography. It's just not as strict anymore. So it really loosened it a lot. And so that's about all you need to know for COCOM and Wassenaar. You don't need to know, you know the details of either one of these agreements. But you can look them up if you want to. All right, so symmetric encryption. So we talked already that symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing. This is symmetric and how it works. One key is used to encrypt the data, but it's also used, the same key is used to decrypt the data. Also called secret key encryption, very fast and strong per bit of key. Uh, major weakness is somehow I have to get the key to whoever I'm communicating with. Uh, keys are often shared out of band method, so we do that sometimes when we share passwords, right? I'll send you the login, and maybe the username and email, and then I'll call you and tell you the password. It's the same kind of concept. Um, stream and block ciphers. So the difference between stream and block is a stream operates on one bit at a time. Block ciphers operate on blocks of bits. Uh, so stream mode means each bit is independently encrypted in a stream. Block mode ciphers. They're really almost all. Almost all the encryption algorithms are block mode. It's not, I don't know of one that actually operates in true stream mode, uh, but block mode, blocks of data, 56 bits for data encryption standard, 128, 192, or 256 for the advanced encryption standard. Um, block ciphers can emulate stream ciphers by setting the block size to one, but they're still considered block ciphers. That's, that's more popular. But the important part is, is stream and block, right? Knowing the difference between stream and block, pretty simple. But it's a lot of memorization, right? Um, one of the problems we used to, you know, that used to be prevalent in symmetric encryption or symmetric ciphers was I take, um, like, there's no randomization at the beginning. So, like, if I open a letter with, you know, dear so and so, you know, and I always open my letters that way, and you decrypted my messages, you would know that the first part was dear. So you already had kind of a clue as to what the plain text was and maybe some insight into the encryption key. So we use an initialization vector to randomize that and start um, really the whole encryption process with some randomization to prevent the patterns um, that usually happen at the beginning of, of ciphertext. Uh, so it ensures that identical plain text encrypted, that's another important thing. Um, if I have two plain texts, so I may have a message that I send pretty regularly and they end up being the same cipher text over and over again, you could potentially infer things about the key or the plain text. So this breaks that up too. Chaining called feedback in stream modes. Uh, so chaining is destroying patterns. So it's really feeding it into the next block to be encrypted. So taking the results of the first block and maybe feeding that or seeding that into the next block. That could either be a sub key or it could be the the entire encryption you know from the previous block too. But chaining is just basically taking what was in you know encrypted uh, in the first block and feeding that into the next block, which also destroys patterns. If I don't, if I just do chaining, just pure chaining, then also errors would propagate. So if I had an error in the first block in the encryption, it, that would propagate to the rest and it'd be worthless. Excuse me. Uh, one of the most popular symmetric encryption algorithms is the data encryption standard. Uh, and that's not actually the algorithm. The data encryption algorithm is the actual encryption algorithm. The standard is the standard. 
uh, made a federal standard uh, in 1976, uh, designed by IBM, IBM on the old Lucifer symmetric uh, cipher, 64-bit block size, 64 bits each round with a 56-bit key. Just have to memorize that stuff. What else do I know about? Well, no, I don't have time. We got so much stuff to get through. Is this fun? Told you encryption is like the funnest. Wait. Science. Science. Beautiful. All right, so five different models probably for the exam. Uh, the difference, so every time I see chaining, uh, that's block mode. Every time I see feedback, feedback, that's stream. So you can already tell at the beginning. So electronic codebook is just very straight, simple, encrypt block by block at a time. There really is no feedback or chaining in electronic codebook. It's just that's the default oldest type of DES there is. Cipher block chaining is taking what was encrypted in the previous block and feeding that into the next block and so on and so forth. That's a block mode. Uh, when I see feedback, that is um, stream mode. So cipher feedback and output feedback are both stream mode or at least stream emulation. The counter mode is actually using a counter in combination with some uh, feedback. The cool thing about counter, and we'll get it, it there's some previous in the next slides, but counter mode allows me to do encryption in parallel. So it's the highest performance of those five modes. And actually the modes going from top to bottom right there is kind of the first to the last, first to the newest. So electronic code book is the original mode. Uh, the other ones were added in FIPS. You'll see FIPS a lot. That stands for Federal Information Processing Standard. Uh, so FIPS 81. You don't need to memorize like FIPS 81, but you do need to memorize the five modes. Uh, and then counter mode is the newest. That gets, a, that gets its own special publication. It's pretty cool. All right, and so I give, um, in the slides, I give you kind of a, an illustration of, and these come, and these are public stuff. I think I just Googled uh, and took the picture. So data encryption, the simplest form, and you can see that there is no feedback into, so it's one block, key combined with one block, key combined with one block, key combined with one block, so on and so forth. So there is no feedback or streaming in this, uh, no initialization vector either. So expect the non-randomness to be non-random. Uh, two identical plain texts will encrypt to the same cipher text. So that's, that one's the weakest, not, not good. Uh, data encryption standard cipher block chaining. The important things about cipher block chaining is it works in block mode, errors propagate, there is an initialization vector. Um, so block mode of DES, because it's got chaining. Chaining block mode, feedback stream mode. Uh, XOR is the previous encrypted block of cipher text into the next block. Well, if that's gonna happen, then expect errors to propagate. The first encrypted block is an initialization vector that contains random data. The chaining destroys patterns. One limitation, errors will propagate uh, meaning one error in one block will cascade through the rest and destroy the integrity of the entire ciphertext. Make sense? That's number two. Cipher feedback. There's feedback. This is then definitely stream or stream emulation. Uh, very similar to uh, cipher block chaining, except for it's in stream mode. Uh, and it really is basically the same errors still propagate. Uh, we do have initialization vector, which will you know, give us that randomness. I think the biggest problem with this one is the propagation of errors. Uh, output feedback, again, stream mode, no propagation of errors. Uh, actually a pretty, you know, I think uh, a good mode. It's just not as good as counter mode because counter mode, if I can do things in parallel, it's gonna be higher performance. So it, this is still pretty slow. Um, yeah, previous ciphertext for feedback into the next, uh, emulation or stream mode emulation. Uh, errors will not propagate. So, and then uh, counter mode. So counter mode, you see the, the counter on the top where it's got the nonce on the counter. That allows me to do encryption because there's no, it doesn't actually feed back into the next encryption. Instead it's the counter and the nonce, which is kind of a weird, uh, almost a weird uh, initialization vector, but there's no like this one, do you see how it feeds back into the next block, into the next block? That doesn't happen in counter mode. Counter mode kind of operates independently. 
um, shares the advantages of OFB and whatever. I, this is what you want to memorize, this table. So block mode, block mode, stream mode, stream mode, stream mode, initialization vectors, every one except for the electronic code book, and then error propagation uh, in cipher, cipher block chaining and cipher feedback, which are essentially the same, just different modes. Is your anybody's mind ready to go? We haven't even gotten to physical security yet. We're not even halfway done through encryption yet. Well, that's right. It's about ready to get real in here. Yep, single DES. So this is uh, the original implementation, just one time through, one key. Uh, it is breakable, no longer considered to be secure. Uh, but it lasted quite a while. 1976, when did I say? Uh, 1976 when it was created, I think it got broken in, I don't know, I can't remember, 90 something. It lasted for quite a while. Uh, but Copacabana, I think, was the first. And there's been subsequent attacks that have been, 97 was when it was attacked. And there's been subsequent attacks that have been even faster at that. Because as what makes it, so the way they it broke it is it's really, uh, uh, so what I'm looking for, brute force. So they tried everything in the entire key space and that's how they essentially broke it. That's very dependent upon processor. So it's very processor intense. So as processors have gotten faster, the attacks gotten easier. So single des, bad, just one key, one, you know, one pass essentially. Uh, triple des is the replacement and it still is a standard, will be through 2030, so this is still acceptable. Uh, not for classified information, so do, this would not be acceptable for top secret or secret information. Uh, applies to DES three times per block, became the standard in 1999. Here's the FIPS standard. Uh, slow, complex, uh, but still, it's actually you know very secure. Triple DES is still enabled in a lot of systems to allow the backward compatibility with older systems. AES and two fish or uh, AES is the new standard and two fish was a finalist to become that standard. So those, we'll talk more about that too later. Double DES is applying encryption twice using two keys. The problem with that is it's, it's, sub, it's subject to a man in the middle attack. So I can start from one end and, and, and the other end and where they meet in the middle. So it ends up that double DES is, is actually just twice as secure as single DES, just a factor of two. Uh, so that's also not considered secure, really. I gotta cough real quick. All right, uh, triple DES. So triple DES, uh, three passes, three times per block. Uh, there's the FIPS standard encrypt, decrypt. So you'll see triple DES EDE, which means encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. Uh, there's different types of triple DES. So I could do three pad times per block with one key, with two threes or three keys. Uh, one triple DES encrypt, decrypt, encrypt is essentially just single DES, so it doesn't really help you much. Uh, if I do two keys and encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, that's better. It's more for like backward compatibility. Uh, 120. So it would take the key strength because I, here I have two keys. Keys are originally 56 bits, so multiply that by two, you have 112 bit key for that. Legacy hardware applications, limited memory, poor performance. Otherwise, I don't know of any places where. We've actually used two triple DES, two key triple DES. I'm sure you could. Uh, three key triple DES is kind of the, the default. Most are using encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. Um, 160 bit key length, so that'd be 56 times three. Makes sense. Um, yeah, that's triple DES. Uh, so encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, same key. So that'd be one key triple DES. Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And that, that's about all you need to know for the exam. But you can see if I use the same triple DES with one key, encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, you see the output is the same, right? So I basically encrypted with one key, and then I decrypted it. So I'm back to the plain text, and I encrypted it again. So. One, that's that's an example of one key triple DES that that's essentially useless. It's the same as single key 
our single DES. Uh, two key, tri yeah, three key. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think. IDEA, this one is patented. So this is not an open encryption standard. It kind of breaks the Kirchhoff's principle for us. Uh, you don't get to see what the actual encryption algorithm is itself. It's, uh, there's no known attacks against it, but I mean, I guess at the end of the day, you really don't know how secure it is if you can't see it and, you know, uh, whatever. I can't have the math guys really dig into it and look at it. And then they introduce 120-bit and 64 bit uh, Primary drawbacks is it, it's patent itself and it's slower compared to AES. That's about all you need to know with IDEA. I've never used IDEA as an encryption algorithm. Uh, advanced encryption standard. This is the new one. This is the one that you'll see everywhere and use, you know, it's the most common now. Uh, symmetric block cipher. Uh, FIPS 197, if you want to look at it. Uh, three different key lengths, 128, 192, and 256. 10 rounds, 12 rounds, and 14 rounds of encryption. Uh, open algorithm, free to use. You can look at the math if you want. I've never even attempted to. I'm guessing it's pretty wild. Uh, free of any of intellectual property, uh, designed or replaced as the way it was chosen. Uh, there was a, a standard. There was a contest, and we they just finished one last year for a replacement for SHA, the, the secure hashing algorithm. Now it's version three. That I think that was just last fall. That one was finalized. So uh, they held a basically a contest. Um, you know, soliciting anybody who wants to replace DES and the Federal Register in 1997. 15 were announced in 1998. A list was reduced to five. You can see what the five are. Uh, so Mars, Revest, uh, RSA is Revest, Shadowman, no, Revest, Shamir, Adelman. They're like uh, well known. I mean, that they're like little g gods in encryption. So is uh, Bruce Schneier. He wrote a book called uh, Applied Cryptography. So if you want to really know more about encryption, that's a great, great book, great introduction to uh, encryption. Um, list was used to five in 1999. Uh, I always say the name wrong. I always want to say Rindell, but I think it's Rindell. It was chosen to become AES uh, after that. But you can still use Mars, RC6, Serpent, and Two Fish, and Blowfish. There's a Blowfish. Uh, the way it works, uh, really four functions. So you'll need to know the four functions. You don't need to know in detail how these four functions work, uh, but it is important to know that AES uses these four functions. One is subbytes, uh, shift rows, mixed columns, add round key. Uh, they all operate on a state, which ends up being a uh, four rows. It looks like this. So each one of those is a 16 byte block. Yeah, it is a state machine. That's exactly what it is. Yep. Uh, so the first one is the shift rows provides the diffusion. So you can see that how things shifted one to the right, left. Sorry. That's the first function. The next function is the mixed columns, which is uh, based on finite math. So I don't know finite math very well. I took it in college, but I can't remember anything about it. But using finite math, it mixes the columns. And there's just an example of the mixing of the columns. Subbytes is a substitution portion of, or a substitution function, and uses a substitution table, so just substituting one byte for another. And then the add round key, this is where a sub key is introduced into the state uh, using the exclusive or function. And that's it. So you don't need to know, you know the details beyond what, what's here for these four functions for advanced encryption standard. Is it hot in here? Is it me? It's hot? No good. OK. I feel hot. Okay, hot flashes. Am I supposed to be getting those hot flashes? Sympathetic, yeah. All right. Blowfish, two fish, these were, uh, these were finalists for AES. Uh, symmetric block ciphers. Bruce Schneier, uh, little g god in security. He also, or not security, 
he thinks he is in security. I think he is in encryption. I don't subscribe. He's got a blog. I don't know if you guys, you guys ever subscribed to his newsletters or blogs or anything. Bruce Schneier. Yeah, he's kind of out there for me a little bit. But definitely uh, well-known and well-respected in encryption circles. Blowfish, 32 through 448. Yeah. Uh, 32 and 448 bit uh, keys to encrypt 64 bits of, of data. A little bit slower, but it is open and unpatented. Anybody can use it anytime they want to. Uh, yeah. RC5 and RC6, more symmetric uh, encryption, RSA laboratories. Revest Shamir Adelman is what RSA stands for. Those guys are math guys, really smart. RC5 uses 32 bit uh, or 64 bit uh, or 128 bit blocks. 64 and 128 are most common. 128 is actually the most common. Uh, and variable key lengths from 0 to 2040 bits. RC6 was the AES finalist, and that's how that works. I don't know if you need to know the details of RC6 and RC5 of how they work or key strengths for, per se, but knowing that these were finalists and they're from RSAs and they're symmetric encryption algorithms would be the important parts to remember. All right, so asymmetric encryption. So we're kind of done with symmetric encryption. Oh, thank you, Rob. So um, any questions on symmetric encryption? All right, asymmetric. Uh, I, I would think that it would probably acknowledge that RC4 is deprecated. I don't know, I'd, I'd be surprised if you saw RC4 on the, on the test, actually. But good to point out, RC4 is deprecated and you won't see any details, I don't think, about RC4. Uh, all right, so pre-shared key, so symmetric encryption algorithm, like I said, it's uh, it was kind of originally developed to exchange uh, so, uh, private keys. How does it feel cold? Does it feel cold now? Hot flashes, I'm having all kinds of problems. But you're fine, Rob, you don't have to change anything. We're good. Probably my mental state. Uh, all right, so pre-shared keys, how do I get one key to another? So the thing is, it's a, the public key is made freely available, so I could use a public key to encrypt something. The only key that can decrypt something that's encrypted with the public key is the private key. So I would keep the private key close. I would protect that, and I would give anybody my the public key. So if you wanted to exchange your secret key with me, just encrypt it with my public key and send it to me, and only I can open it. I've got your key and I can do the same thing back. I can take your public key and encrypt the, you know, a secret key if I want to start communication that way and so on and so forth. Um, Whitfield Diffie and, and Martin Hellman created the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Protocol in 1976. RSA uh, was invented in 1977. So RSA, the algorithm, not the company, Oh, 1977 is another asymmetric encryption algorithm. Two keys, one to encrypt and one to decrypt. They're called a key pair. Uh, they are mathematically associated with each other. Um, so you can't just encrypt anything with a public or private key. It has to be paired up. Um, math lies in the asymmetry. is a one-way function. It's not one-way hat like hashing, but one way a one-way function. So something that... I can easily compute one way, but it's extremely difficult to compute backwards. Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, two methods. One, one is the factoring prime numbers, and the other one is the uh, exponentiation problem. Um, so factoring prime numbers is really easy to do it one way. It's really hard to do it back the other way. So in this case, the example here is taking the prime number 62. So if you know what a prime number is, it's only divisible by itself in one. So taking 6269 and multiplying it by 7883 gives you this composite number of 49 million. It's easy to compute it that way. It's a lot more difficult to compute. Give me, you know, give you 49 million 418,527 and tell me which two prime numbers make that number up. That's the difficulty. So that's one of the basics or basis is of asymmetric encryption is that I'm going to encrypt it make it difficult this way, but easy easy this way, difficult that way. So that's one way. Make sense? Okay. 
The other method is called the discrete, discrete logarithm. So I can take some number to some huge power and then you get this big number. And so that's seven. So in this case, seven to the 13th power, that's exponentiation. So seven times seven, 13 times gives me this big number. That's the easy part. The hard part is giving me this big number is saying it's seven to what power? That's the logarithm. And, the, and when, when we're talking like these numbers are small, really, in comparison, we're talking like very, very, very large numbers. So instead of 96 billion, it might be 96 with like 100, you know, 100 zeros afterwards or something. I mean, it's, it's big numbers. Uh, so these um, this is the basis for RSA. The discrete logarithm is the basis for Diffie-Hellman and El-Gamal. Okay, memorization again. But that's the secret to asymmetric encryption. Uh, the Diffie-Hellman key agreement protocol was really meant, originally it was designed just to share the symmetric key across a public channel, across a public network. And a public network would be something that I don't have physical control of the network from beginning to end and all the components in it. That would be a, a non-public network. You don't have to, I, I put the little picture there. That's how it works, but you don't have to worry about how that, you know, if you want to noodle it, you know, you can noodle it, but you don't have to, it won't be on the test. What will be on the test is what the Diffie-Hellman protocol is and a little bit about how it works. Uh, another asymmetric encryption algorithm is the ellipt elliptic curve cryptography. This is faster and stronger than discrete logarithms. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, than discrete logarithms and the prime factoring prime numbers. Um, and it's usually used on low power devices like uh, mobile device, mobile phones, uh, things like that because it is uh, less computational and it's faster. This is easy to put on to a, uh, remember we talked about RISC computers, reduced instruction set computing. Uh, elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography fits well in that application. Um, so like an ellipse, and this is all math, but you know, visualizing it, you know, you have an elliptic curve and the discrete logarithm falls somewhere as a coordinates on that elliptic curve and that's the difficult. So giving you the plot is the easy part. The hard part is getting it back. Shorter keys, faster. Uh, asymmetric uh, and symmetric trade-offs. So that's a good table. It's, I think it's also in your book about the trade-offs. So, you know, key strength comparisons um, for the different encryption algorithms. You have triple DES, 112-bit key in triple DES uh, equates to, I would have to have a uh, 2048 key, like for instance, um, RSA, for equivalent strength, meaning how difficult it would be to decrypt uh, through a brute force attack or other means. So that's, so asymmetric encryption, slower, so I'm not going to use that for the bulk of my communication, typically. Uh, weaker per bit of key, how they usually fit together is I'd use asymmetric encryption to trade the the symmetric keys and then use symmetric encryption for the rest of the communication, right? Any questions on that? Again, through symmetric, what? Yeah, more memorization, right? Uh, yeah, so that's symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Now hashing, hashing is just a one-way function. It can't be reversed, you can't, it's not, I create some difficult problem, now how do I find my way back, or can I find my way back? There is no way back, it's one way. So it's taking a variable length input, plain text, and creating a fixed length hash value, or ciphertext, basically. Um, what's that? I would use that to, um, like, for instance, passwords. So instead of me having to transmit, so when I type in my password, and it, what gets stored is actually the hash value, in the server rather than my password. So if the server were compromised, you'd get the hash value of my password, but you wouldn't actually get my password. Now, the next time I log in and I type my same password and it gets hashed again, it should hash to the same exact value, right? And then you compare the hashes. Now I've been authenticated. 
that'd be one way you could use it. You can also use it to uh, validate integrity of a file. So if I take a, a file and I run it through a hash, it'll come up with a hashed value. If there's any changes to that file whatsoever, it'll hash to a different value. So I can validate that that file is not changed over time. You know, I mean, file integrity checkers would use that kind of function. Um, yep. Yep. So uh, encryption through uh, an algorithm, no key. It's called a one-way hash function, no reverse to it, variable length plain text. So it could be, now this means that there's definitely the possibility for collisions, right? Because if I take a 20 megabyte file and it's going to hash to, let's say, uh, a 128 bit hash value, there's different spaces, right? I mean, a 20 megabit file is a lot, a lot of bits. And everything gets hashed to this same uh, hash length. Does that make sense, sort of? So there's going to be collisions. They're all susceptible to collisions if they have a fixed length hash value function uh, called a digest or a hash, simply a hash, uh, used to provide integrity. So if the hash of a plain text changes, the plain text itself changed because different things tech, different things hash to different hashes. Uh, older hash functions, SHA-1, 160-bit 160 160-bit hash, MD5, which is still actually pretty popular for doing hashes of file uh, changes. You know, it's not uncommon to go do a download from the internet and also have them provide the hash value. So if I wanted to calculate the hash value, I would compare it to make sure I got the file I intended to get when I downloaded it. 128-bit hash for MD5. Newer alternatives such as SHA-2 and actually SHA-3, which SHA-3 is probably too new to be in the book, but SHA-3 is out and should be used instead of SHA-2. Uh, so collisions means that two uh, different plain texts hash to the same value. That's a, called a collision. So hashes can't be unique across the entire space because, like I said, we have we only have a limited number of possibilities in the hash function itself. Um, more than one document can have the same hash. That's called a collision. Collisions are always possible because of you know what I just explained. Plain text is longer than the hash, but it should be very difficult to find. Um, so knowing that collisions are always going to be possible, we want to make them as difficult as possible to find, which makes the hash strong. So it's not that they can't be, that there are no collisions, it's how difficult is it to create collisions, which makes it strong. Uh, frequent or collisions, it really depends on the, on the hash uh, algorithm. I think they're all pretty rare, actually, even MD5, but I'm sure you could find um, real values on the... Uh, the internet. Uh, so knowing the hashing algorithm will not allow you to reverse the hashed value. That's correct. Uh, okay, so MD5. MD5, Ron Revest. Hey, there's our RSA guy again. Same Revest. Uh, created the 128-bit hash value based on any input length. So no matter what input, how long it is, it's always going to hash to 128 bits. Uh, weaknesses have been discovered where collisions can be found in a practical amount of time. Practical is up for debate. It always gets compared against the work factor. Uh, so it's kind of arbitrary. MD6 is the newest version of MD5, uh, first published in 2008. And that's about all you need to know for MD5. It's still very popular, though, like I was saying. Uh, SHA, a series of hash algorithms, SHA-1, 1993. There's the FIPS, FIPS-180. Uh, SHA-1 creates a 160-bit hash value. SHA-2, you know, recommended over SHA-1 and SHA and MD-5. SHA-3 would actually be recommended over those now. Uh, first announced in the register in 2007, the competition was held, and the standard was announced last fall. And there's the standard. So if you can support SHA-3, SHA-3 would be your best bet for hashing algorithm. Uh, Haval is, is uh, variable length hashes, so this is a little bit kind of better, I think, maybe, um, because I have variable length hash values, which makes it a little bit more difficult to find those collisions. 
um, different message digest 128, 160, 192, 224, 256, depending on how many rounds, three, four, or five. But the variable length hash values, I think, it also complicates the implementation, though, of hashing. So pluses and minuses. It's not really, I don't think, all that widely used. MD5 is still probably the most widely used because it's used for a lot of file integrity checking still. All right, questions about SHA or hashing? We are freaking experts now on symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hashing. We have 25 minutes and we're still not done with encryption yet. All right, so brute force. This is, uh, brute force is the only really uh, attack against uh, modern encryption that is always going to be successful, except for a one-time pad, uh, if you're following those three rules, right? Um, in your key space. The problem is the key space may be huge, right? So it might take many, 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 many years for you to get to the, to the entire key space. So uh, the work factor exceeds the value of the data. So it's it, we still do brute force attacks, though. You know, I think um, mainly on hash values, looking for those collisions to try to do password cracking. Um, you know, other types of attacks, known plain text, uh, chosen plain text, and adaptive chosen plain text. So in known plain text attacks, uh, I'm trying to look for the key. So I have the, uh, the plain text and I have the ciphertext. And so I'm looking for what the key is. So I have the input, I have the output. I don't know what's in the middle. That's what the goal is in a known plain text attack. A chosen plain text means I get to choose the plain text that gets encrypted. Uh, and adaptive is the same thing, and again, the goal is to derive that key. An adaptive chosen plain text is that in next iterations of the attack, I'm going to adapt based on what I learned in the last plain text attack. So, chosen plain text and adaptive chosen plain text are, are types of attacks. Chosen ciphertext and adaptive chosen chosen ciphertext is the same, but the opposite way. Instead, I'm going to um, use the ciphertext to be decrypted. Um, so it's just in, the, just in reverse. And then based on what was decrypted uh, in an adaptive, uh, I would change my attack, adapt it to subsequent rounds. Uh, meet in the middle attack is starting encryption or starting the attack on one side and then the other. This is really only used for uh, double des if you ever find double des. Um, rare. Known key. So this seems kind of weird that if I know the key, what's there to attack? This is actually a little, little bit of a misleading. I don't know the key. I know parts of the key. I know certain characteristics of the key. Uh, so I don't know the whole key. We do this a lot in password attacks. You guys use things like Loftcrack before or uh, different type of password recovery tools before. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, in the past I've been asked to do those types of attacks. And so, I, you know, I ask what your password requirements are. And so they say, well, minimum of eight characters. Okay, well then, I know that the whole key space, smaller than eight characters, I don't even have to work on those. So it's a known key attack. I'll start between eight characters and maybe 14. So I'm going to guess that people aren't making their passwords longer than that. So I'm going to keep the known key characteristics between this and that, and then you know kind of go from there, right? So I'll try to deduce things before I start the attack. Um, uh, Eric Jensen never got never got loft to crack a password successfully. John the Ripper has worked better. Yeah, there's everybody's got their favorite tools for sure. I like the older versions of Loftcrack better, but I like older versions of a lot of things better. Differential cryptanalysis. Um, I'm trying to think what that is. A oh, difference between plain text and so we're looking for the non-randomness in in the attack for uh, differential cryptanalysis. So looking at different pieces of plain text that are being encrypted, and then looking for non-randomness in the ciphertext. Again, trying to find the key. Linear cryptanalysis, side channel attacks. So linear is um, large amounts of data created with the same key and looking for patterns in uh, in the, the thing that makes 
linear cryptanalysis is that the large amounts of data, it's really the same as a plain text attack, it's just large amounts of data and I'm looking at different, you'd be looking at different things. A side channel attack is not actually an attack on the crypto system itself, it's looking at other external things to try to infer what the, how things are, are happening like CPU cycles, power consumption, spikes, things like that, be a side channel attack. The birthday attack. This is about the birthday paradox. If you put 23 people in the room, odds are greater than 50% that two people will share the same birthday. Which is kind of weird when you think about it because most people approach that like you're meaning that if I go into a room with 23 people, the chances are better than 50% that somebody's going to have the same birthday as mine. That's not the paradox. It's that two people in the room will have the same birthday. So it's a little bit different. Uh, used to create hash collisions. Key clustering is when two symmetric keys uh, produce the same uh, ciphertext. Two uh, different symmetric keys create the same ciphertext. Digital signatures. Uh, digital signatures use, use hashing and uh, to create basically the non-repudiation in, in signatures. So we introduce uh, kind of certificates into this function, but take the data, hash it, sign it with my public key, I'm sorry, with my private key, and then send it on its way. The receiver then hashes it, decrypts it with their public, or with, with my public key, and then compares the hash values. So that way, I signed it with my private key, so you know it came from me, because when you decrypt it with the public key, the data is integrity is still there. That's one thing, and you can validate that nothing changed in the file based on the hash value. Like if anything had changed, it would hash to a different value. So that's the two pieces to a digital signature. One, that it came from me, and two, that it never changed. The part that makes sure that it never changed is the hashing. The part that it came from me is the asymmetric encryption. It was signed with my private key. Make sense? That's the important parts of uh, digital signatures. HMAC, uh, same sort of thing as the public private key that we talked about in the digital signature. HMAC is, uh, uses the symmetric encryption with the hashing as opposed to the asymmetric encryption with the hashing. HMACs are used a lot in IPsec. IPsec is you know, a very popular VPN uh, protocol method of encrypting data. And that's about all we're going to go through on HMAC. We're nowhere, we're not even going to come close to getting through this whole class today. I still have like 100 slides left. I worked way too hard on this today. I should not have done 100 slides. That's okay, though. We're going to get through it. So being that we're, we, I'm going to acknowledge right now that we're not going to make it because we're, we're not, no way we're going to get through the rest of this and physical security in 15 minutes, which I think was that makes a challenge anyway. I don't. That's one thing I don't like about the way they reorganize the domains, because you had three domains. This is this one domain is three domains, and it always took at least two classes to do the next domain, which is the technical stuff. So that's okay. We'll push things back a little bit, and we'll use. We still have that extra class at the end. We'll just use that to make sure. Because I'd rather guess get through everything with some understanding rather than just slam through it. So. Uh, PKI, public encryption, or, I'm sorry, public key infrastructure. There's a public and private PKIs. Um, it's, a, it's a way to use digital certificates. So really what a digital certificate is, is a public key signed with a digital signature, is what a digital certificate is. And I would use that digital certificate a lot of times to validate, I can do it for a lot of things, but I would validate essentially my identity, that I am who I actually say I am. Um, so the, when you use PKI, when you use a digital certificate, um, it should give you um, that validity that I am, you know, the authentication piece it should be who, who I say. The digital cert, uh, certificate format is the X.509. You don't have to dig in deep on what X.509 is, just know that the digital certificate format is X.509. Yep. Uh, certificate authority. Certificate authorities kind of run the PKI. Um, digital certificates are issued by certificate authorities. It could be an internal certificate authority 
or a public certificate authority, at the end of the day, the certificate authority has to be very trustworthy, trusted. Right? If it's a private certificate authority, so it's one that I run in my own, you know, organization. You know, it's pretty easy to trust that. And the public ones, like VeriSign, has to be very, very trustworthy and thought as two examples here that they you know, run a tight ship, that they're, you know, legitimate organizations, whatever, because so much trust is placed in them because they're the ones who actually validate um, the identity of people receiving certificates. We also maintain certificate revocation lists. So the certificate revocation list is just a list of certificates that have been revoked. They've been lost, stolen, compromised. The organization was using it for bad purposes, whatever. They'll, they'll revoke the certificate. The trusted certificate authorities typically are like stored in your browser. So if you, you know, go into the settings of like Internet Explorer or, you know, uh, Firefox, you'll see there's certificate authorities that are uh, and then when you run into certificate of certificates that are uh, that aren't on that list, maybe it's an internal certificate that's been created because uh, you can create one without a certificate authority too, or your own system is the certificate authority. Just create one just to, so you can encrypt the data. But I'm not really caring about uh, validating the identity of the server. We run into that all the time. Uh, you know, self-signed certificates. Uh, those wouldn't be in my browser, so I'll get that thing that says, hey, do you want to trust this? And you do it and whatever. IPsec. Uh, we're going to dig in deeper in IPsec when we get into the next domain, but, you know, some of the basics. Suite of protocols. Um, a lot of people complain that IPsec is actually way too complicated and way too fat for all the stuff that it does. I mean, no offense to fat people, because I am one, so we're good. Like I said, not politically correct here. Uh, so suite protocols, uh, IP version 4 and IP version 6, it's actually built into IP version 6. IP version 4, they never built security into it, so they've never been able to really make it secure, really. Uh, but it's built into, it's part of IP version 6. Uh, one of the methods used to provide VPNs, it's still probably the most popular method of providing VPNs. Two primary protocols are authentication header and encapsulating security payload. Uh, and they do what they the name says. So authentication header, its primary purpose is to provide authentication for the data, the data packets. Encapsulating secure the payload is it is it it uh, encrypts the data. So two different you know functions they play together and they overlap a little bit, but they're two different things. Um, different sometimes overlapping functionality, IPsec protocols, other ones, Internet Security Association and key management protocol, ISA camp. And Ike. Ike. I have a dog whose name is Vike. Unrelated. Uh, okay, so authentication entered and encapsulating security payload. So what you see over there on the right, you'll, you will get to know packets a lot more later on. But basic. Authentication header, you can see how it just replaces, it puts a header, or replaces a header in front of the TCP uh, portion of the packet, I guess. Uh, whereas encapsulating security, security payload replaces a lot more and it encrypts the data. So AAH is really, authentication header is just providing authentication for the data packet and ESP is actually encrypting the data and providing the authentication typically. Make sense? All right. AAH, uh, I'm just going to say AAH because it's easier than saying authentication header. That's a lot of more syllables that I don't have to use anymore. So AH provides uh, confidentiality, access to digital, digital signature, protects against replay attacks. Uh, ESP uh, gives you the encryption piece. ISA camp and security association. So whenever you set up an IPsec session, there has to be a security association set up. Uh, it's simplex, meaning it's one way, both ways, if you're doing both systems are communicating. Uh, negotiates the ESP and AH parameters. So what encryption algorithms are we going to use? Um, offsets, all kind of stuff go into that. We'll talk more about that in the next class, or two classes now, I guess. Two systems communicate via ESP with two SAs, one for each direction. Yeah, and you'll just have to memorize the other pieces. 32-bit called for uh, SPI, Security Parameter Index. If you don't get it now, that's okay. We're going to go a lot deeper with this later. Which excites some of the uh, 
technical folks, non-technical folks. A tunnel mode and transport mode, two different modes. So it doesn't matter if we're talking ESP and AH really at this point. It's what mode is it operating in. Tunnel mode is typically from a client to uh, it's setting up a, uh, a VPN tunnel, right, in the traditional sense. And the transport mode is typically with two systems that already speak IPsec as part of the protocol stack, so there's no actual tunnel established. They always kind of communicate that way. So that's the difference between tunnel mode and transport mode. And I gave just a, a brief example of what the two look like. The tunnel mode has a new IP header. The transport mode doesn't. That's the biggest difference between the two. Yeah, it's truly a tunnel. It's got a new IP header. Uh, I don't see anything about the data traffic. And then when it gets to in tunnel mode, when it gets to the other system and it gets basically stripped of that, uh, with the original packet. All right, uh, Ike. Uh, different encryption algorithms. So Ike is going to help us choose which encryption algorithm we're going to use. It's the Internet Key Exchange. Uh, you can set this up. You know, I don't know if you, many of you have set up uh, VPN tunnels before in like a, a Cisco device or really any device, and you can choose which encryption algorithms you're going to allow or use. This is a negotiation that takes place. I negotiates kind of the strongest, best encryption algorithm between the two systems. And then that's what it's going to use. So there's a negotiation that takes place with Ike on which one we're going to use on the other side. Cool? Maybe? All right, SSL, TLS, uh, both work in conjunction with HTTPS, so SSL is older, TLS is the successor. Bunch of attacks against, what's that? A uh, bunch of attacks against SSL over the years that, uh, crap, I already forgot the name of the attack. The, uh, what was the attack I just talked about? The drone attack is, attack, is an attack on SSL. Um, so, John Beast, Logjam, yeah, there's lots of attacks. And a lot we don't know about. I'm sure Will knows about some more that I don't know about. <laughs> but he's, this is John. So it provides the encryption, really the confidentiality of the web traffic. And the way it typically works is it's kind of like the asymmetric. So I'm going to use the web server's public key uh, to you know, establish this connection. Um, and then uh, the web server is going to be able to decrypt that uh, if there's no pre-shared key for us to communicate with each other. And then we're going to agree on a symmetric key, and then we're going to use that for the rest of the discussion or the rest of the session. In the simplest sense, that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. I think it's just the implementation. I don't know the details. Yeah, the, the why SSL, there were weaknesses, I think, in the implementation. And I don't know the details of what those weaknesses were. Yeah. Yeah, there was a number of successful attacks against SSL. Poodle, I think, yeah. Number of attacks against SSL that just rendered it kind of no longer fixable. PGP, PGP's been around for quite a while. Phil Zimmerman, he had gotten a lot of trouble, had a lot of legal issues trying to get PGP to stay as it was. Uh, asymmetric encryption, I suppose. Um, not in the truest sense where we've got public-private keys, but it's more built, built on a web of trust model. So if I trust you and you trust Phil, then I'm going to trust Phil and Phil's going to trust me. And, you know, that's essentially how PGP works. Now it's it was, I mean, it was bought a while back by McAfee, was it? Semantic? I can't remember who bought PGP, but it's now somewhere else. You don't need to know much more about that. MIME is a, is a way for me to encode mail messages. SMIME provides the PK, provides encryption. Uh, over that, a secure method of you know, transferring email. You don't need to know too much more about SMIME. Escrowed encryption. Uh, so <clears throat> this allows uh, two organizations would share, or maybe more, portions of the private key 
And so if something bad happened and you still needed to get at the data, certain events would happen and it would have to be very well spelled out in the legal documents or a court order would uh, allow these organizations to release portions of the secret key so then you could decrypt data. That's essentially how secret key, I'm sorry, you know, escort encryption works. <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not really a big fan, but whatever, it happens. Clipper chip, um, this one caused a big stir a while back uh, where um, the, the government uh, was using escrowed encryption in telecommunications devices so they could do warrantless wiretaps and a num number of other things. They wouldn't say wire warrantless wiretaps, but I mean, you would, seriously. So, you know, Firestorm 1996, and then it was the algorithm itself, 80-bit key uh, was released, declassified in 1998. Not too much about clipper chip. But if you hear about clipper chip, that's what we're talking about. It's road encryption. Is everyone, uh, got abandoned because everybody got mad at them. We should do that with taxes. If you could just get mad enough at taxes, then maybe we don't have to pay taxes. Steganography. So the thing about steganography is hidden. It's hidden communication. So you can use steganography in concert with encryption because then I'd be hiding the fact that I even have any communications going on. So not only, and if you did find out that I am communicating, you wouldn't be able to get the plain text anyway and know what I'm saying. So it's kind of just an additional level of, uh, it's not encryption really, it's just hiding that we're doing anything. Um, images are really popular to hide data in, and there's a bunch of tools you can download to do this yourself. Uh, there's freeware that you can do all kinds of steganography things uh, yeah you can hit and hand it you can hide it in data files too you know certainly um, usually usually you like you take um, in, in steganography you make such slight different changes to the original file that it's un, not detectable by humans computers can detect it pretty quickly though see if I hash the vessel image and I hash the stego image there in the, di in, the, in, the, in the graphic, they would hash to two different values because they're two different images, right? So if I'm using file integrity checking, then I would catch the steganography here. What's that? Yeah, I'm sure, yep. Yeah, if I'm doing file integrity, so as an attacker, it might be a good way to hide something on your system is to use steganography, you know, put it in a file somewhere or put it, you know, put some data. Uh, but if I'm doing file integrity checking, then I should catch that. And, you know, that's a good thing to do on sensitive, high security servers, I suppose. Digital watermarks. Uh, encode data with into a file. Um, could be hidden using steganography, but really what it's meant to do is um, be able to track this file back to a source. Uh, usually. So if I put a watermark on a file, uh, I know where the file kind of came from. And that's what this story is about, was about the flushed away movie. And this came from, this comes from the book uh, where they were trying to figure out, you know, what, how do they stop pirating of DVD movies? And, you know, so they uh, watermarked all the movies. And when they found the pirated copies, they checked the watermark and found out it was this one person where it came from. So that's a good way to use a watermark. We're done with encryption. All right, you guys ready for another two hours? Physical security? Yes. Yeah. All right, well, we'll, we'll leave off there. Kind of dis I couldn't talk any faster though, could I? A lot of stuff? Okay. Is it helpful today? Okay. Well, we'll hit physical security on Thursday. We'll, we'll drive through as fast as we can without trying to be, you know, cut corners. Um, I, the good thing about Thursday is I already have the content made. It's the next 80 or so slides in this slide deck. Uh, 